Welcome to the Startup Grind. Let's welcome the great Paul Alstrom. Thank you, Jess. I'm excited to be here. Sorry about moving the schedule around on you guys, but uh, um, I'm glad somebody, you guys actually, you know, were able to make the, the night also. Um, I met Jess's father, uh, whew, 20 years ago? Probably 20 years ago. He uh, was the VC behind my startup, Nolix. And, uh, and I met him uh, through the work of the Wayne Brown Institute. So where's Wayne Brown here? <laughs> so I was an entrepreneur in Utah, and I presented at the Wayne Brown Institute. I actually met his partner first, and uh, Mike Lee. And then uh, Jess's father actually uh, sat on my board of my company. And so and then Jess was little, and then eventually she grew up and got married. And, and so it's fun to come back and, uh, and give back a little bit. Um, but that was kind of, you know, I don't know why they took a, a risk on me. I had, I was nothing, right? I didn't, had never done it before. First time CEO and uh, spinning out of a company. Really didn't really deserve to raise the money, but they took a, a, a chance on me and kind of gave me my big break. So when Jess called, I, I don't have a choice. I had to come. Um, so I'm going to kind of give a little internal perspective about um, my entrepreneur journey. And another, another title for this presentation could be Confession of a Small Thinker. And uh, every couple of years since I've been a kid, I've come up with some kind of an idea. And I've launched it. And for me, ideas are very dangerous because I, I dwell on the idea, I fall in love with the idea, and then I go do it. And so I have to be careful. And I've created some tools for myself that I want to share with you guys around around uh, what happens when you have an idea. So I'll give you a little journey of my first 11 companies. Every two, uh, literally every two years, um, starting with the lemonade stand, and then uh, the skateboard business, and then the window washing business, and the lawn mowing business when I was 15 and 16. I had a great truck, and we would, we would do about 30 lawns a week. Then I bought a pool service, and, uh, pool service company Actually, we did, we did landscaping maintenance and sprinklers, and I had a pool service company, and it took me up to college. So by this time, I am 18. And went to college, uh, actually uh, went to Ecuador for a couple years for, as an LDS missionary. Came back, started a student newspaper while I was at school. And uh, a lot of fun, not sure why we did that, but it was great, and uh, the next thing I did at school was I started a dance club, and I ended up creating this dance club called the Ivy Tower, and it went on for about 10 years after I left. Uh, and I and I fall in love with these ideas. I came up with it. I remember the moment that my friend and I were brainstorming this idea for a dance club. He said, wouldn't it be cool to have this student hangout? Oh, actually, no, this is my next one, sorry. After the dance club, it was uh, a, a jazz club dinner theater. And so we're having this conversation with Mark Tullis, and I remember the moment where we're brainstorming you know, a dance club is cool, but it's not very sophisticated. And wouldn't it be cool to have a student hangout? And we, we sat there and we brainstormed the whole thing as to what the optimal student hangout would be. And we ended up building the Backstage Cafe. So at this point, I'm in my early 20s. I'm at college. And I have classes, but my passion is doing startups. And we would hang out with, and we had dinner theater, comedy, and it was a very sophisticated club. It, we, we did, it was a jazz club. And uh, it was great until it went belly up. <laughs> and uh, my next thing <laughs> was a homeless project. <laughs> uh, not because I was homeless, but I saw these guys on the road that were stealing the recycling. And I said, you know what? We could, if those guys are willing to work to steal my recyclables, I bet you I could get them to work inside of a company. So I created this project called Spin Recycling. And we had, ended up having a team of 40 homeless guys that were created the first recycling pro company in, our, in, that, in that town. And, uh, and, I, and the next project I went on to do was a water purification service company. So some of these I sold, some of them I shut down, um, about half and half. And it was during this project, doing this, I was now mid-20s, uh, making you know, a little over $100,000 a year. The owner of this manufacturer that I provide the services for said, you seem like a smart kid, but you are not acting in your self-interest. 
And I said, well, I don't understand. He said, you can spend 24 hours a day building rocket ships, or you can dig ditches. Wouldn't you rather go to the moon? I said, what do you mean? He goes, you're thinking so small. Your entire career is not going to get you where you want to go. And nobody had given me permission to think big up until that time in my career. I, this is kind of an embarrassing public, you know, public confession. I, 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 didn't, I didn't translate. This was before the venture industry. This is before the tech industry. And I just thought a business was a business. And, and I, the next day, I quit. And I handed the keys to the business over to my dad and my brother. And I went back to school, and I said, that is, he's, I mean, it just hit me like a ton of bricks. And I literally stopped that very moment and said, you're right. This is never going to take me where I want to go. And it was the most important question that anybody had ever asked me. Um, wouldn't it be more fun to go to the moon? And, and so for those of you that are small thinkers like me, I give you permission to think big today. And, and by the way, it's easier to think big. It's easier to raise money. It's easier to attract talent. Um, it's more fun. And you have the same 24 hours in a day. Do something that's more interesting with your life. And ask yourself, is this the idea that I want to be spending the next three to five years of my life working on? Just because I'm doing it right now doesn't mean I have to keep doing it. So the next thing I tried, I discovered the software business. I fell in love with the software business, and I launched a company in 1988 that was doing great until it wasn't. And, uh, and I, it, was my, it was my first education. I realized I knew nothing about the software business, and I had no business being in business. And so I went to work for somebody else. It was my college experience. I had finished college, but I went back, and I started uh, working for a company called Folio. And it was the first text retrieval engine in the marketplace. It was Google decades before Google. We had a five and a quarter floppy disk on a, on a uh, DOS screen. And when Windows came out, I was the product manager that brought this text retrieval engine into the marketplace. That was my experience. I took some technology. I spun it out from Folio. That was Nolix. That was the company that Jess's dad invested into. And that's what launched my career. Um, when I started Nolix, I had six months of cash runway. I was married, mortgage, and a kid. Um, and my wife at the previous, I was, I was working for somebody else and she said, you are not happy. I don't care if we live on the street, but you got to do something that makes you happy. So she shamed me into quitting my perfectly good job and going and doing a startup. And I had six months of runway and it had to work. That is motivation. I burned the boats and I've been totally un unemployable since then. I don't know anybody that would give me a job because I, uh, I, I fell in love with um, doing this. By the way, I'd done a lot of startups before, but it wasn't until I got married that it all kind of came together and I focused and I thought bigger. So the combination of getting married and thinking big, um, magic happened. In my career, I went on to sell the software company. I sold this, the company um, two years later. It was a great outcome for me and for the investors. and. Uh, and it was during, it was, I sold it in 1999, August of 1999. And the stock market was doubling like every three months. <laughs> and so we sold the company, and during the lockup period, the stock doubled. I'm like, this is amazing. This is so easy. And, uh, we, and, we, uh, and then I sold a quarter of my stock, and then the stock went up some more, and I sold a quarter. And a friend gave me this strategy. He said, um, if you want to optimize your returns, minimize regret. That, made me, that statement made me more money than everything else I've learned in my entire college career. Minimize regret. So it would go up, and I'm like, ah, I'll sell a little bit. But it might go up more. So I, I optimized to minimize my regret, not to optimize the return. And then it doubled again, March 1st, 2000, and I sold everything on that day. And that was three weeks before the, the, the bubble crashed. And so the, the stock had quadrupled in that period of time. So that gave me the resources to go do something else. And we ended up launching a venture fund. And I've launched eight funds since I raised a billion dollars. And I've launched uh, over 125 startups since those days. So I was still working 20, you know, 12 hours a day. I just was working on something that more people were interested in helping me on. So what am I doing today? 
what I'm doing today is I'm working on, I have a fund called Alta Ventures. And a few years ago, I was invited by the Mexican government to help create the venture capital industry in the country of Mexico. And I came home and I told Jenny, we just got invited to create an industry in Mexico. Let's go do that. And she said, let's go do it. And so we moved to Mexico. And it's been a blast. Uh, we created a tech fund in Monterrey with the wonderful people of Monterrey, uh, amazing families, and the Mexican government, Nafin, Inter-American Development Bank, Multilateral Investment Fund, and the Fondo de Fondos program. So the government and the families came together, and we created this project. I then, when I also previously, I just ra I'd raised a growth equity fund there, and then went on to raise the first fund of funds, non-government fund of funds in Mexico. So they had a Fondo de Fondos. We raised the first government non-fund of funds, $250 million fund of funds, and to help startups. So we've raised about $500 million for the country of Mexico, and, uh, and every day I'm grateful to the guy that said, wouldn't it be more fun to go to the moon? Um, our strategy for our fund is we look for interesting opportunities in Latin America, and we help them go global. And then we also look for interesting opportunities in the United States that are looking to go down into Latin America. And we, so we view ourselves as kind of a bridge capital. If you want to go to Latin America, or you want to go back to the United States. And so we facilitate the flow of ideas across borders. Um, my mom was born and raised in Chihuahua. And, uh, and so I, I love Mexico, I love Latin America. And so it's, it was fun to go back down there. My grandparents, I spent my summers down there as a kid. So I have focused most of my career now on helping me <laughs> or that guy in that picture. And, and if you think about it, that was similar to what I was doing. Ready, fire, oh, aim. And I was just shooting arrows. And, and by accident, nothing was hitting the target. And you know, you think after a while, just by chance, something would hit the target. And there, but the reality is, uh, you know, most startups fail. And if they're not failing, they're not, in, you know, at that, at that same rate, uh, it's like a 70 to 80% failure rate. You're in a small, niche business. And event, effectively, you're walking dead. So I create these little walking dead companies that nobody's interested in. And there's lots of reasons for startup failure. And, and the odds are against us as entrepreneurs. I have my share of failures. Here are some of them. <laughs> I have a PhD in failure. Uh, and one of the things I've noticed as an investor is that the more money that I invested into a company before they nailed the breakthrough value proposition. This was an observation that I started gaining. As, as somebody gave me money and I was putting it to work and I started noticing that these companies were raising a lot of money with a lot of smart investors. Levanta had Kleiner Perkins in before us. Those guys raised $90 million with a very smart management team. Hit the wall. The product really never worked. Cogito, $30 million. Hit the wall without getting the product out the door. What in the world? And, and the opposite was true. The companies that we starved, starved, starved until they nailed the breakthrough, the customer product market fit, were working. And so it was basically human nature. The capital was replacing the market and, and blinding us to the problems of the customer. Expensive lesson. You're welcome. We've sold a few companies over the year, and we've taken a few companies public. Um, but the reality is that most entrepreneurs have no idea why they're successful. And the guys that talk about it, I noticed I'd, I would consume every startup manual and book and go to all these events, and most of these guys were just making it up. They had no idea the reasons for their success. And the guy that invented the Ethernet said the same thing. as I don't know I'm successful. Most people don't. One of our observations, and now doing pattern recognition over hundreds of companies, and is that we as entrepreneurs misprioritize our activities. So let's assume we have a great idea. Let's start with that. Our activities um, follow a, a traditional process that um, was built uh, for existing large companies as entrepreneurs. And we transferred that process over to the startup world. And I found there's things we could do as entrepreneurs to take out the deal killer risk early on, very effectively, and preferably before you even raise your first dollar. The, one of the, the biggest observation I had, kind of gave you a, a precursor to that, the number one reason for startup failure by far. This was, there was a project called the Startup DNA Project that my co-author, Nathan Furr, who's a Stanford PhD, participated in Silicon Valley. And in the analysis, there was one reason that 70% that of startups failed in the study. 
Anybody know what that is? Any guesses? Something to do with money. Um, there's hundreds of reasons selling was not it. Well, that's what Clayton Christensen says, the startups that fail the ones that run out of money. And <laughs> uh, Tame Dynamics, uh, great idea, huge problem, but wasn't the number one. Doesn't, wasn't payroll. What's that? Scaling too early. Boom. Premature scaling. Number one, and, uh, and so it was my observation also, right? All of our failures, great teams, sophisticated investors, great market opportunities, too much money too early, premature scaling. I like to say it another way. They were doing good things out of order. Huge, uh, v, the right VP of sales comes along. Oh, we got to get this guy. You're kidding me. He raised an oracle. You know, it's great. Oh, we, oh, do you know what? We don't have a product yet. Um, oh, we just launched our beta. Uh, did you, did you um, do an alpha? No. Did you do your prototype? No. Did you do your virtual prototype? No. So there's an order and a process that we can go and learn and listen, but we basically, um, human nature is when we get an early, a, a big commitment to something, we have... Uh, we hold on to that and we, we overcommit and, and for lots of human nature reasons we don't let go of this thing. So there's economic principles all built around, around these concepts um, that basically are, are human nature. So we pre-commit, overcommit, and then we start protecting our decisions. And because uh, and we can't be stupid and we're, 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 we don't, we don't want to be embarrassed or there's lots of other psychology behind that. So, huge problem, and, I, and, and so I put tools in place to prevent myself from doing this with our companies, and it happens all the time. Lots of examples of premature scaling. My favorite is uh, Webvan and Cosmos. Over $800 million raised, and they didn't really optimize their business model before they raised any money. Their business model had to work at perfect harmony, <laughs> at scale, in order for them to work money. There was, there was no room in their business model for in not working at, at you know everything clicking, and uh, and nothing ever works. Um, it took them eight hundred million dollars before they shut it down. Cosmo, another great example of startup failure. These guys raised two hundred eighty million dollars, delivering things to people without charging them. And <laughs> that was it. Is it free delivery? Y they'll go pick up a candy bar for you, and bring it to your house and charge you for the candy bar. The delivery is free. So finally, after $280 million, somebody said, uh, the emperor has no clothes on. This is not working. What would we do with $280 million? <laughs> We'd probably, you know, not do that. A lot of the roots of startup failure go back to what I call the traditional waterfall development model. How many product guys are in the room? Do you guys ever use the, the waterfall development model? Raise your hand if you use that model. Okay, it works for large companies with existing problems, known customers, known distribution channels, uh, known pain. That works great. I have an idea uh, for the new product I want to build. I build out the specs. I build my alpha. I test the product. I sell it to the customers. It works great because it does already have pre-built-in pain. I am doing sustaining innovation inside my company. Works fine. I take that model and I translate it to the startup. It does not work. So we basically inherit as entrepreneurs this model from large companies. The only problem is we ain't large companies. A little company is not, a startup is not a big company that's just a little bit smaller. It's totally different. We have a different problem we're trying to solve. The, the large company is, as a start, so let's say this, as a startup, I am researching what my problem is. I am investigating, I'm trying to probe and understand. And I, I have a completely different process because I don't have known customers with known pain with existing distribution channels. So why use the, the big company model for a startup that is not a big company? Well, it doesn't work. And I can tell you, <laughs> hundreds of millions of dollars invested, it doesn't work. And as the product manager for a product, I'll show you a case study in a second, I can promise you it doesn't work. And I'll, I'll, I'll publicly expose my stu stupidity at how, trying, that, trying that waterfall model and how it didn't work. So we, we all go through this. We wake up with an idea. 
we fall in love with her idea. My baby's not ugly. And, and then we go tell our friends, I love this idea. What do you think of my idea? And they're like, yeah, your baby's not ugly. And, and, and from there, we're stuck, right? Because it's just an escalation of commitment from that point. It's all downside for our family and friends to tell us our baby's ugly, so they're just not going to do it. They're like, yeah, go, go for it, Paul. It's great. <laughs> and then so I commit. I have this escalation of commitment where I go start building it. As soon as I build it, I'm dead, right? Because now it could be the Mona Lisa. It could be Frankenstein. I have no idea, but it is beautiful. And I have this escalation of commitment until someday I meet the customer. And, and there is a high probability that's in the 90% that I missed. Maybe it's 100%. Once in a while, somebody gets it right, and then they come back and lecture everybody how smart they are. But the Pareto principle is 80, 90% of us will fail in that process, and 10 to 20% will get it right by accident. And uh, that's what was so puzzling. Those are the startup failure odds, by the way, also. So that, bro that model doesn't work. About 16 years ago, I started um, lecturing on this observation that I had that that model doesn't work. And then I ran into Dr. Nathan Furr, who, who got his PhD at Stanford in entrepreneurship. Brilliant guy. He's now teaching at NCIAD in France, one of the top schools in the world. And he said, my doctoral research is based on your observation. And I said, we well, want to write a book with me? Uh, because nobody would believe me, but they would believe you. And so we got together, and we wrote a book. And I would give these speeches, and I would record the speech like I'm doing tonight. I'd create a transcript of the speech, and I'd throw it over the wall to Nathan, and he would put some stories with it, and then he'd go do the, put the research in place. And that book's called Nail It and Scale It. And uh, I can't believe people are still buying it. I mean, it's been, but it's been amazing. So it, my book came out before the Lean Startup came out, and that came out and said, hey, that's what I've been doing. I just didn't have the branding right. I, Nisi didn't really nail it and scale it. So the idea, it's, it's sort of like the Lean Startup. But it's basically, you begin with the customer up front in the process, revolutionary. <laughs> and you start having this conversation with the customer early on. And you, you start talking about the customer's uh, pain and, their, and the job they're trying to do and the context of the pain. And you can learn a lot about what you need to do in that process. Tons. But you can't learn everything. So you can, but the, pro but the idea is you learn as much as you can take your hypothesis and what you believe to be true, and then you go launch. And there's other things you can't learn until you launch. And, and these are these unknowable things that happen along the way. So you have to be willing and flexible to adapt and iterate. And so I like the lean process because it talks about iterating and pivoting, but there's a whole bunch of work that should happen on the front end that, I, that I've seen that has been missing from much of the startup world. So I'm gonna share with you some ideas to how to improve the, dramatically improve the probability of success. And this is stuff I have done myself from concept, raising capital, all the way through liquidity, and then I've invested in startups, and I've done it many, many times. So once you have an idea, ask yourself personally, is this really what I want to be doing with my life? Is this, where I was going to is this a dead end for me? Is this going to take me where I want to go? And I think for, that has to be part of your personal mission as an entrepreneur and an individual first, is this right for your family? And make that commitment and make sure your significant other is on board. That's one of the key questions that I ask because if, if the spouse or the significant other is not on board, this is way too hard to pull off without total support. And there's no way I could have pulled this off without my wife, impossible. All right, so one of the tools I've built is a big idea canvas. I don't know, how many have ever heard of the Big Idea Canvas? Nobody, anybody? A few, one, two, three, four, okay. Go and, go and download the Canvas tonight, and uh, I think it'll be helpful to you, and I'll, I'll do a little workshop. And so the rest of the conversation, I'd like to open it up and allow you guys to ask questions real time, and I'd like to propose that we do a challenge in Idaho to do a Big Idea Challenge for Idaho. I'm just making this up right now. I just typed that in there. It doesn't really exist. But I think Jess, if we, if, we, if we tell her to go out and raise some money to give you guys a prize, you guys could have you know, bragging rights within the community here that you won the Big Idea Challenge. And we've been doing these all over the world. We, we're doing one in Jamaica right now. We're doing one in Peru. We're, do, we're doing one in Mexico, Guadalajara. And these are uh, contests to pull the community together, and then we provide mentorship and a little bit of capital 
and some other services to the entrepreneur that has that idea. We help them patent their idea through the provisional patent phase. All right, so here's, this is the part where you can stop me and say, all right, what about this? That doesn't make sense. Feel free to stop it at any time from this point going forward, okay? Please do. So once you have an idea, stop, please. The first thing I think you should do is write it out. If I had written out <laughs> my idea for the, um, the, the water purification business, I am going to spend the next five years of my life under people's sinks in Southern California. It doesn't sound that great when you write it out. I'm going to help people purify, get cleaner drinking water by s servicing dirty units. I mean, just come up with a sentence that you have a story that you can get excited about. And if you can't get excited about that, there may be a problem just in that. And had I done that simple step of just describing my idea, and as I go tell people about it, if I can't generate enthusiasm and excitement around this, I have a problem. So the first step is describe your big idea. Sounds simple. Oh man, I bet you 70, 80% of the people that do the canvas can't even come up with a hook and a storyline. Why is that important? Because if you're going to raise money from me, you have to have a hook. And it has to be simple enough where I tell, tell me about your idea, and you go, Brr, sentence, two sentences, and I'm like, oh man, that makes sense. And if you can't do that, you cannot raise money. So you'll be coming back to that sentence over and over again, refining it and refining it, and, and, then, and maybe you just throw it all out together because it may not be worth your time. Okay. Next, go to the canvas, download it. That's kind of what it looks like. Here's another version of it. And, and uh, you can go get your own PDF. You can go right now and download it. And I've updated the canvas, and so it's a little different than this one here. But um, once you go through and you fill out these questions, the next step is it generates a hypothesis for you. And so we're asking questions, and then it pulls from your questions a hypothesis that you then take into the market and test. It's very cool. I take every one of my startups through it as we go into invest, and then every time we come up with a new idea, we take it back to the canvas to challenge and check our thinking and help us walk around the idea. And so if, even if you have a startup, I would go back into it and say, hmm, so let's, let's kind of jump into this. We have an online version. It's an interactive version. You ask questions. They ask you questions, and the wizard kicks out your, your, your canvas and kicks out your hypothesis. That's pretty cool. We do not take your ideas. We do not look at them. We don't have access to them. Um, unless you want to share them with us. Once you've filled out your canvas, then at the end of this, there's a button you can push, and you can upload it into an online interactive mural. It's a company called Mural, M-U-R-A-L dot C-O. Super cool. It's an online interactive whiteboard that your entire team can collaborate around. And we have lots of templates in there. We have the business model canvas template and a lot of templates. And you can pull any object off the internet onto this mural, and we give it to you free for six months. Um, it's one of my companies out of Argentina, Mariano and the Pato, great entrepreneurs. As our, as, um, our job as an entrepreneur is to kind of come up with these ideas and innovations, and then we take it into the customer and ask them to help validate it. So let's kind of walk through an idea or walk through the canvas briefly. The first step is talking about the pain of the customer. So who's your customer? But it's not just who's your customer. It's who's the buying panel that influences the purchase decision. So on a B2B play, you have the user, you'll have your IT person that will influence it, you'll have your economic buyer, you'll have the manager. There are many people that you have to influence. If you're going to the enterprise, it's like selling to the US government. You have to, it's a complex sell. So you need to not, not only understand who your customer is, but it's not that simple. You, there could be a complex group of customers you have to influence to make a purchase decision. So step number one. Number two, what is the job they're trying to perform? And the, so you need to understand the context of what they're doing in their day. So it's not just the title and the name of the business card, but they help, they'll have lots of jobs to do. And then the third is what's the problem they're experiencing in context of doing that job? All right, so who's your customer? What's the job? What's the, what's the pain they're experiencing? And then here's the two killer questions. 
how big is that pain and how often do they have the pain? Now big makes sense, right? So is, is it a shark bite of a pain or is it a mosquito bite of a pain? Um, and the next question is the frequency of the pain. That was a question I never read about anywhere. My brother sold a company recently. Uh, he was an advisor to this company and they sold it for I don't know, a lot of money. And, uh, and he taught me about this concept of frequency. And Google buys companies like toothbrushes that you use two times a day or more. And so frequency is critical. And it's fact, like, in fact, it's one of the most important um, pain factors to get a, what I call a monetizable pain. One of my favorite examples of this is, uh, is I was sharing with my brother Jason this, this idea. And he goes, oh, this reminds me of the Homer Simpson episode. And, uh, and so Homer's you know, trying to, is, I'll set this up a little bit. Homer finds out he has a long lost brother, has a car company and, uh, called PM Motors. And so he hires his brother to come build the ultimate automobile to save his car company. a big one then we don't have a big one why not because americans don't want big cars well then give me one with lots of pep sorry our cars don't have pep why not uh because americans want good mileage not pep homer <laughs> tell the nice man what country you come from america do you hear that you morons this is why we're getting killed in the marketplace instead of listening to what people want you're telling them what they want homer i need your help you do yeah I want you to help me design a car. A car for all the Homer Simpsons out there. And I want to pay you $200,000 a year. And I want to let you. I want a horn here, here, and here. You can never find a horn when you're mad. And they should all play La Cucaracha. Can do, Mr. S. And sometimes the kids are in the back seat. They're hollering. They're making you nuts. There's got to be something you can do about that. Maybe a built-in video game would keep them entertained? You're fired! What is my brother paying you for? What about a, a separate soundproof bubble dome for the kids with optional restraints and muzzles? Bullseye! And another thing, when I gun the motor, I want people to think the world is coming to an end. Rum, rum, rum! Ladies and gentlemen, esteemed stockholders, members of the press, your holiness, tonight... We are going to witness automotive history. All my life, I have searched for a car that feels a certain way. Powerful like a gorilla, yet soft and yielding like a Nerf ball. Now at last, I have found it. Ladies and gentlemen, presenting the car designed for the average man, the Homer. Any questions? <laughs> All right. <laughs> so um, how many have done this? How many have built a product without knowing who the customer was? Come on, hands high in the air. Um, I've done it. <laughs> we, we start with the technology, right? And they're moving forward. And we didn't like, oh, we didn't really realize who the customer was. Turns out Homer was not the the uh, uh, the best customer for this car. There was a it was seventy two thousand dollars back in the early eighties. There's a lot of money. All right, all right. So why am I spending time talking about this? Because human nature has us build first and go before we will spend that next that extra effort. So so expensive, so painful. Here's my and uh, and by the way, this was actually done in the automotive industry. The, the Homer Simpson episode was based on the Edsel. Single biggest failure in automotive history. Six years later, they came up with the Ford Mustang. Lee Iacocca led the design team, having husband and wife teams come into mock showrooms and, and interact with the design and through the process, and the single most successful launch in automotive history from the same company six years later. What was the difference? The Edsel was built in total secret silence. It was named after Ford's dead son, and who's going to say something bad about the chairman's son, you know, who just died. Oh, it's, you know, it's a great car, sir. And they built, they launched dealerships and a whole infrastructure around this thing. And, and you know, anybody could have told you that thing's not going to sell just by looking at it. But they insulated themselves from feedback. 
we do this the same. Here's my confession. Thank you for confessing. Here's my confession. So I was product manager at Folio Views. I won PC Computing. Um, uh, use, uh, I won a PC Computing Award and a Pu Editor's Choice Award. I was so excited. And uh, PC Computing on the left, PC Mag on the right. And uh, actually, actually, PC Magazine. And in the review, they said it was the mix, mixer, master, slicer, dicer, Ginsu knife of software products. I had built a product for everybody and for nobody. It was a technology Frankenstein. We sold this product into 85 different markets, 24 different applications, 2,040 different intersections of market and application. We were totally technology driven. And it was my job to try to be customer and market driven. I thought we we're building this rocket ship and then pieces started falling off of this business. And we were um, levitating about 200 employees. We were not profitable, but it turns out there was five employees of the company that were driving over half of the revenue. And they had completely nailed a niche. And the rest of us were searching for customer product market fit, but didn't really have the whole equation put together. So I learned that lesson I'll never ever forget. Every new product and service, as you're launching a new product into the marketplace, has a first customer, like WordPerfect was the legal secretary. You need to wrap yourself around that first initial customer, satisfy them, that's your beachhead as you come into the marketplace. I learned about the process for identifying customer pain early on and moving um, eventually towards the, uh, the building process, but doing a lot of work on the front end of that process. So, here was my strategy when I spun out and I created a company called Nolix. I said, I'm going to take one of those product market intersections and I'm going to focus all my energy there. So I picked the IT knowledge management space. We actually went back and did analysis of every customer we ever sold to and every application, how much money was generated. And we found out that naturally people are attracted to one of the segments we're looking at, IT knowledge management, customer service and support for text, in text retrieval. Spun a company out, focused on that, raised money from Jess's dad. We raised uh, $2.7 million on the initial tranche, and then we raised another 2.7, so 5.4 total, and we uh, sold the company two years later uh, to a public company in San Diego, which eventually they sold to HP, which is here. So, <sighs> customer product market fit. Okay. We don't have time to go into all the details, but I have hours of stories of every single point on this canvas. And, and um, I'll share a couple more with you. Um, we'll jump ahead here. Vinod Koshla says, any big problem is a big opportunity. No one will pay you to solve a non-problem. I get it. I believe that. And I talked about the shark bite versus mosquito bite, but I also talked about the frequency. This was a business idea that my brother-in-law um, bought into and was selling these smoke masks. And he said, it's, this is mission critical. You could, it's a shark bite of a pain. What if you're caught in a fire and you don't have a smoke mask? And I said, yeah, you're right. What if I'm caught in a fire and be in a hotel? And, and so he's creating this problem, right? Um, what's the problem that he's missing here? Frequency. Frequency. <laughs> How many people have ever been caught in a fire in a hotel? Nobody, right? Or maybe a few people, but they're probably dead, right? So, <laughs> but we don't think about it, right? We're not going to be carrying this mask around for 20 years. It's at some moment, we might get caught in a fire. And so, they spent years on a business that had no frequency of pain. Nobody bothered to ask that question. So, frequency is huge. So, your monetizable pain score is the level of the pain times the frequency. And if you have monetizable pain, then you can come talk to me because you don't have a brand or reputation or anything as an entrepreneur, but if you've nailed the pain, you can build on that. All right, next, market potential. Lots of things to focus on. I'm gonna, I'm gonna focus on one specific item here. I'm just gonna, you can't see it in the back. I'm gonna read it out for you. What's the current overall size and growth of the market? I created this question because I didn't want to miss Uber or Airbnb. Is your market currently small and slow, big and slow, non-existent but has big potential? Ask yourself, it's okay to be invisible today as a marketplace, but is it huge? Or is it a small but fast-growing marketplace? 
those are the kinds of opportunities that I think are interesting that have, there's a shift that happens in the marketplace. It could be a regulatory shift, it could be a technological shift, it could be a cultural shift of the market, but those shifts that happen, those market dislocations, and, those, and they move very fast. So as you're looking for speed, speed of switchover, speed of adoption, something happened in the marketplace, and that's the areas where we look for, market first. And, and so this canvas was created as part, as a tool to help us ask that question, and then will your solution affect the size and growth of the marketplace? And if your solution is not going to affect the growth of the marketplace, it's a small market that's not growing, or it's a large market that's stagnant, think about your problem differently at that point. Here's what, saw, here's what sparked me to create this canvas. In addition to my problems, I was judging the International Business Model Competition a few years ago, and these guys came up with this um, idea called the bed sled, and it's an air mattress on the snow, air mattress with handles. They were about to win the competition because they had run the lean startup perfectly ex executed. The problem was they started with a really stupid idea. How often do we have this problem? Me, never. <laughs> Shark bite or mosquito bite? Uh, less than mosquito. So it's a less than one that I never have. And these guys are about to go launch and spend the next three to five years of their lives working on this problem. And all the professors at the university were saying, it's awesome, you guys have run the proce lean process perfectly. I said, well, that is broken. And so that's what motivated me to go create the Big Idea Canvas so this doesn't happen again to me or anybody else. Next, solution for the pain. And um, what's interesting about this is we as investors will invest into disruptive innovations or lots of innovations, but the the requ our requirement is, it's got to have an innovation. It could be a customer service innovation, it could be a, a product, it could be a technological innovation, it has to be have some kind of sustaining competitive advantage or we're not going to do it. Here's my definition of innovation, the intersection of technology or invention and market insight. It's where the new widget comes in context with how the customer and the market are going to position and, and, and own this and, and, and use it. And that's your job as entrepreneurs, is to go through those interviews so you can intersect the market insight with that technological innovation. This is one of my favorite slides. It looks ugly. A friend of mine, Rob Ryan, came up with this. And one of the questions we have on the canvas is, do you have the core competency to pull this off? Rob built four back-to-back -back billion dollar companies using this model with no failures in between. Um, one of his companies, he sold for $24 billion. And I took it public and sold it for $24 billion. His model is he has a team that has world-class core competency. And then they build off that core competency, identify problems and market opportunities that leverage the core competency. Honda has a deep core competency in what? Machinery? Huh? Motors, world-class motors. They build off their core competency, cars and lawnmowers and generators, off of their deep core competency. Ask yourself, are you world-class at this? Because if you're not, you are probably not gonna be able to raise venture dollars or to build a world-class company. You don't have to build a world-class company, you can build a lifestyle company. But don't kid yourself. Um, go find somebody and uh, pull a team together that's world-class at this thing and build a deep core competency. You may have the ability to be the visionary leader, but you're going to have the, uh, you need the others to fill out the other skill sets. And, and when Rob does this, he identifies these world-class teams and then intersects them with very important problems. Um, I won't go into to detail on his case studies, but right, right now technology was the second one he did. He, is a, he was an investor and a board member and he did that, they did that company, he wasn't the CEO, they did that in Bozeman, Montana. And they sold it for a billion and a half dollars to Oracle. They did it in Bozeman where it's so difficult to recruit. Well, we're in Boise. You guys have all of the core resources you need to build multiple billion dollar companies in Boise. You have large companies, you have the nice ability to attract from multiple areas, a lot of things going here. All right, positioning the marketplace. This is the question I get asked most often. 
So on this particular one, it says, um, you know, where, where, where's the competitive landscape of your company? Empty jungle mon monkeys, apes, gorilla. If you have a 900-pound a gorilla in that marketplace, ask yourself, how am I going to enter this marketplace? Am I competing head-to-head -head with that 900-pound with that gorilla? Um, that's called a face punch strategy. So we can provide some tools to kind of help you identify your market entry strategy. Are you going to bolt on? Are you going to extend it? Are you going to disrupt from the bottom? So let's jump ahead and talk about um, market entry strategies for competing. So if you're Facebook and PATH. PATH try to compete with Facebook. Switching costs are very high. Um, and PATH's thinking they could just switch the, to Facebook with better features. The reality is PATH spent tens of millions of dollars and couldn't pull it off. If you have an entrenched market leader, it's very difficult for that market leader to, 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 to pull them off. All right, so we're running, we're running short on time. Let me jump ahead. And, uh, and so these are, these are ideas. We'll, we'll share the slides with you. There's multiple ways to enter the marketplace. And the idea of the canvas is to help you walk around and think about whether this is a 10x idea, or this is a, a new geographic innovation. This is one of our companies that we we took in a US idea for Square and we took it into Latin America and created Clip. One of the, one of the most effective ways to enter the marketplace is disruption. And I'm going to leave you with this, with this thought. It's the most cost effective way to look for an unserved, underserved, unloved customer at the low end of the marketplace where the, the market is not thinking about it. So when Facebook took over the marketplace, and owned the social networking, as they expanded, what happened is the low end of the market became unprotected, because as parents got on, the kids got off. And so you, you have opportunities for, for Instagram to enter, Snapchat to enter the market. And as the, these, these new unprotected low end customers, Facebook wasn't positioned to even go after that because of the structure that they had created. The kids wanted a, a safe place for their own stuff, and they didn't want mom and dad looking over the shoulder. So as I talk to the entrepreneurs we work with, we try to come up with, how do you know if this is a good idea? And often these disruptive ideas look really stupid, like Snapchat, eight seconds of text, that's a dumb idea. Um, 30 million dollars, 30 billion dumb. Here's, a, here's an idea, let's let people rent our couches. The, the big disruptive ideas often feel stupid. Um, let's help people take the bus. This is one of my favorites. Let's help teenagers that are standing next to each other text each other without Wi-Fi. Or when you're getting married and you have all those ideas, you want to share them on your cork board and you want to put them online and share them with everybody, the, the initial seeds of billion dollar ideas often feel stupid because why? Because we're sitting on a well um, served demand curve and we're looking at that new market saying, I would never do that. That's not something I would do. So the entre as an entrepreneur, we would need to go to that customer that's not currently being served as, as kind of down market. Here's a visual to kind of help you feel what it's like to be that unserved, unloved customer. This guy's dancing out in the field. He's got a startup. He's ready to go. The world is going to flock to me. They're going to love this idea. It's going to be awesome. All I need is to get myself uh, maybe a product marketing guy. There we go. So me and my product guy, we're going to go and do my customer interviews. We're going to do our customer product market fit and, uh, and, and figure out this whole lean process and, until we go do our, get our startup off the ground. Now, it takes my product guy a, few, a little while to get into the groove. He's kind of stumbling around a little bit. But now he's going. All right. Now what we need to execute is we need to bring in an engineer. So we need, we need our hacker to help us. There we go. So we got our product visionary. We have our CEO. We have our CEO visionary, product guy. We got our hacker. Now we need a few sales guys to help us get this thing off the ground and get it going. Enter sales guys. There we go. One, two, three. All right, starting to work. Let's get a few more guys on board. Hey, it's not bad. We got a startup going here. And now we still look stupid, but we look stupid together. And then as it starts, as it starts running, and like, we're probably at a point where we can raise some venture capital. 
and we have a legitimate company that has a chance of going public. And I say when girls in bikinis start sprinting at you, you've got something. And after a while, this entire field is, is completely emptied over to this corner, dancing with this guy that's doing this crazy dance. How many have felt like that? The guy that's out in the field, everybody thinks it's ridiculous. By the way, it just goes on forever. And there's literally thousands of people standing there at the end. So, that couch surfing business was obviously Airbnb. Over 550,000 listings now. That bus taking business is a company you might not have heard of, but you will, it's called Wanderoo. It's like kayak for ground transportation, helping millennials take the bus. I didn't know millennials didn't have cars, I had no idea. They take the bus. And, this, and um, they have Wi-Fi and high-end buses, and these guys won the CES uh, show, number one at the, in, at, Comdec, at the computer show in Vegas. This te helping teens text business is a company called Jot. Um, they went crazy helping teens text without Wi-Fi and a peer-to-peer -peer mesh network at schools. 40% of US teens don't have access to the internet during the day, and their biggest need in life is to text. And so these guys came up with a way to put all these phones together on campus and create a mesh network. It's ingenious. The corkboard business is obviously Pinterest. I don't get Pinterest. I still don't get it, but it's the fastest growing social network on the planet. I don't have to get it. <laughs> Facebook is declining over here. It's shrinking. And so you think about it, these new disruptive areas that we don't get, I'm well served on my demand curve. I look down, I'm like, that's a stupid idea. Not so fast. And so take your stupid ideas, take them to the canvas, and, uh, and, and uh, I'm gonna jump ahead and, and pass through this. And, uh, and, 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 and walk around. And then my, my email is paul at altaventures.com. If you have a question and you want some feedback on it, reach out to me. And, uh, and if you think it's something that's worthwhile, I'd, I'd, I'd love to explore it with you. Um, I'll be glad to answer any questions. Uh, this has been, been kind of a fun way to share a personal journey with you and, uh, and some tools that we use every single day in the trenches throughout um, all of our platform. We have offices in Monterey, Mexico, um, Buenos Aires, Argentina, Lima, Peru, Silicon Valley, and Utah. And, uh, and we are in the process of trying to help ignite the entrepreneurial ecosystems of Latin America and train them in best practices and jump forward with uh, avoiding all of the errors that we generated in our first generation of startup in the United States and get to the, as we're launching these new knowledge economy jobs there, get it right the first time. So thanks for your time, and it's been fun being with you today. Thank you, Paul. Thank you so much. Um, do you want, do you have like five minutes for any Q&A? Sure. Sure, sure. Do you guys want to take some time for Q&A real quick? Um, anyone, we can just jump right in if you want. Does anyone have a question? Yeah. yeah. Competitive advantage and your thoughts around building a defensible moat? I, I love that idea. Um, Warren Buffett says, you know, billion dollar companies are very complex and you build the moats around your business. And that sunflower model was designed, and, and so uh, my friend Rob Ryan talks about, um, billion, he also talks about how these billion dollar companies are very complex. So if you have that competitive standard, core competitive uh, advantage, that sustainable core competency, you're building new customers and products and markets to address leveraging your core competency. And, um, and that sustainable advantage, each of those different markets you can lean into depending on how, and which way your, your, your company is going to go. Your first idea usually will take you for a season and then it will taper off. Uh, one of the companies we invested into was a company called CrimeReports.com. Uh, it's, in, it's in my book, and the, and the entrepreneur did a great job of identifying this first niche. The challenge, I thought, was at th where he rode that niche and didn't come up with his next innovation, and his next innovation, his next innovation. So he nailed the first one. It was working, but he didn't leverage, he, didn't, he, never, he didn't really identify what industry he was in and what he was doing and understand who his customers were and go deeper into the problem set. And so I think sustainable advantage has to be 
It can't, that, that product will have a life cycle by definition. It will go up and it'll come down. Can you throw more products into the market and continue to leverage your, your core competency to go identify these next opportunities as you go deeper into your customers and provide more value to them? And so I don't, I don't believe that one product is gonna take you all the way there. It, it's, by, it, it's never happened in history, right? It'll be for a season and then, it will, and by nature, there is that bell curve and, and life will, it will taper off. And so you need to be providing sustaining internal innovations and then working to cannibalize your core business and think about how do we compete with ourselves to take it to the next level. Does that make sense? That's a great question. What's the biggest difference between helping startups here in Latin America? In the United States, we naturally give trust. We, we, we trust somebody, well, maybe not in Idaho. <laughs> but in most states, <laughs> We naturally trust somebody until they prove us otherwise. And in the, in the startup world, we need, th that's, we, um, business happens at the speed of trust, as Stephen M. R. Covey says. We have to have that, 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 that creates a huge competitive advantage because the opposite of that, distrust or corruption um, that causes distrust is sand in the gears of business. And so one of the big differences is in Latin America, you are not trusted until you earn that trust over time. And it takes a long time to earn that trust. And so things happen slower, and they can't happen at startup speed. It's, it's very difficult to have that pulse. And so one of the challenges is if, is if you want your startup community to get going, you need to be able to do things in that community that increase the trust. And when I help go, and one of the things I do when I, before I go and invest is we have an advanced team called the Alta Innovation Institute and they'll go into countries early and help build out the entrepreneur ecosystem to establish um, deal flow and help build trust in that marketplace within the, entrepreneurs, the entrepreneur ecosystem. Single biggest difference. And, and it, it, the, the factors of production in, in the startup world, land, labor, capital, plus trust, that's the next major one, and it's something that is sorely missing in most emerging markets. It's why they're emerging markets, because they have corruption and that and that's, that's one of the major drivers in poverty. So my belief is that the startup world can fix that if we can create these little bubbles of communities that are operating at Silicon Valley speed because they trust each other. And we found that we have to go younger to find the guys that are, have, that are still idealistic and want that, want that world for themselves. It's a great question. I love that. Um, can, can, I, can I ask a question? question? Will yes. you talk, talk to us a little about burn rate? rate? I, think I think my favorite story of yours is maybe a company that went through $10 million in 45 days. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, well, it's Clayton Christensen says it's the guys that don't run out of money that make it. <laughs> and, uh, and how do you maintain control is to make sure that you have enough runway. Period. Cash is king. It always will be. Don't, don't believe the press, you know. Don't and, and so one of the companies in Utah that a very good friend of mine founded, Paul Allen. He calls himself Paul Allen the Lesser, not the Microsoft Paul Allen. And he built a company called Ancestry.com. And he kind of plunked along, had a million dollar run rate, and then they came in and raised a bunch of money, 75 million to be exact, and they bought some companies, and then they would crank the burn rate up to the ceiling. They're burning two, three, four million dollars a month. And I get a call from my, my good friends and, and uh, his brother, Kurt, and they said, we're hitting the wall in a few weeks. We're out of money. Well, what happened? Well, the VCs told us that, you know, revenue didn't matter. I mean, it was eyeballs was what they cared about. <laughs> and they cared about, you know, do this and do this. And so they listened to their board and they cranked their burn rate up because they were trying to chase some, some metric. And the burn rate got so hot that they only had a few weeks of cash left. So we came in and put together a syndicate with uh, Dave Moon and Dev Tons and Dan Campbell. These were the SNET founders. Excuse me, the Word Perfect founders. They had a fund called SNET and Jim Sorensen, senior, and, uh, and Ralph Yarrow, who had a fund called Canopy Group. And we put together a, uh, a $15 million round, and we gave them $10 million to fix the problem. Uh, so we did a bridge to the payroll, $10 million. 45 days later, before we hit the first board meeting, they had burned through the $10 million. I was the first one to find out about it. And uh, I was talking to, the C to Greg, the CEO, and I was like, how did this happen? It was like a perfect storm, right? They assumed that a lot of things were going to happen. They spent $10 million in 45 days. So everybody freaks out. 
Nobody at that point, nobody wants anything to do with it because they just burned 75 plus 10, 85 million dollars and everybody was totally done with this company. And, uh, and so we dug into this and we realized that there was issues that, there was, it wasn't gone money, but it was probably inappropriately spent early, too early. So we committed to put the next five million in, but we had to make a few changes. And one of the changes was burn rate. So we just, <laughs> we took the entire myfamily.com business and we reduced it from a couple hundred people to one half of one full-time employee. <laughs> Super painful. We shut down the New York office. We shut down the Orem, Utah office. We consolidated everybody in one building. We forced the sale of a company called AHA. We spun off a company called Third Age. And uh, we said, by the way, your new business is genealogy. And uh, this is your core business. And we forced the, the company to focus. Well, they wanted to, by the way. This wouldn't force them to do anything. Focus on this core business of genealogy. And they ended up having, the, and with that $5 million, um, and some of the investors came back in, they bottomed out, never raised any more money. And they went all the way through to, they raised some debt money, but no more equity money. And they went all the way to IPO. And they went public, and the peak IPO value was $2.2 .2 billion. And so you couldn't give that thing away. And their main value exchange for the customer didn't change for years. They just had an inappropriate burn rate for, the, for their company and were misfocused on the resources. So anyway, um, that was my first deal out of my first venture fund. And I looked like a total idiot because these guys had burned through the money. And I'm like, I'm done. Nobody's ever going to give me money again. And it turned out to be OK. But Paul, thank, thank you so much. much. He's catching catch another flight, and he's running to do these business model comp competition judging. judging. So. Thanks, thanks for everything, and thanks, thanks for checking, checking us out here in Boise. It's his first time here, so welcome to Boise. I like Boise. Have a good night, everyone.